Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another Dynamic Leader Conversation. So this week we are talking about leverage. I guess that at its very roots, um, leadership is all about leverage and influencing others to deliver optimal outcomes for our business, um, along with remaining engaged and inspired in the work being done. Um, and so today I'm joined by Rob Pine, who studied psychology at University College in London. Uh, he specialises in human judgment and decision making, uh, which is really exciting. Back in 1997, which, by the way, was the year I finished high school, um, he quit his PhD to move to Australia, where he joined the world of advertising, rising to become chief strategy officer of a global agency before setting up his own firm um, in training called Realizer, and that was in 2013. Uh, he's recently published a book called Unlock, Leveraging the Hidden Intelligence in Your Leadership Team. And what Rob discovered is that the best way to improve decision making is to work with leadership teams to unlock their creative intelligence. So today, let's talk about that. Leverage, creative intelligence, uh, collective intelligence, and all the other stuff that comes with it. So thank you so much for joining me, Rob. Thank you. Great to join you today. So good to have a conversation with you today. Um, and to kick off, given that the topic is around leverage, is what does leverage mean to you in the realm of leadership? Well, so the subtitle of my book talks about leveraging the hidden intelligence in your leadership team. And for me, my mission really is, is, is to, to kind of help the world make better decisions through helping teams be more than the sum of their parts, right? So, so we have this view of leadership being a very solo occupation, like there are, you know, there are 60,000 plus books on Amazon around leadership. And there's only four books on leadership teams. And mm -hmm. I find that crazy, right? So, so, so my view is the leverage word is around how can you be more than the sum of your parts? And how can you surround yourself with people that together make better decisions and do great thinking and execute on great projects? So that's the key to leverage, in my view, is that collective leadership. And, uh, you know, in a leadership team, something that's probably well underutilized. Yeah, look, I mean, this is why I have a you know thriving business in this space is because leaders come up through the ranks and um, through their, a lot of time, their individual contributions, they're very successful and they lead a division or a functional area. And then you put them into an executive leadership team and the rules are different. The rules are different and they need to leave their ego at the door and they find that difficult. They find that difficult. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done because you know a lot of leadership teams are or less or at least no more than the sum of their parts. And so when you work with leadership teams, are you looking at um, how do you um, align with how you are as a as part of a leadership team with how you are as a leader? And, you know, the reason for my question is often I find that sometimes the behaviour in executive meetings gets taken back to teams on the floor and it's not appropriate um, and so is there alignment or is there, you know, what needs to be done in that space? Because I think some leaders at that level don't do the transition very well. I treat them as overlapping circles, if you imagine a Venn diagram, where you, in, in a leadership team, you're actually being asked to step through the door. You, when you walk through the door, you're a leader. And when you step through the door and sit down, you actually need to balance being a leader and a follower. Mm. And that's difficult. You can't have it your way. It's not command and control. It's a little bit more democratic. And potentially, you know, if you're in the leadership team, only one of you is actually the leader of that team. And so by default, you've got to balance leadership and, uh, and following. Whereas then when you walk back out the door again, you do need to go a little bit back into being the leader of a team. And so those behaviors are different. Uh, but ideally, they've got their core, their core, core center of things like emotional intelligence and thinking about how other people are computing around the world, around listening, all those things, around how you bring out the intelligence of the people around you. Mm -hmm. So a lot of overlap, but also I do treat them slightly differently. Mm. Yeah, yeah, great. And I think, um, you know, sometimes it's the, uh, I don't know, like if, if someone in a, in a leadership team meeting is doesn't feel heard or doesn't feel validated or feels like their ego does take a little bit of a hit, can often then take that back to their team and and reflect on them through that is what I've observed with with some leaders yeah look I was I was working with a client say, say last year right where um there was a notion of the leader of this division wanted all the people in the leadership team to consider 
the leadership team as their A team. Right? This is your A team, implying that the the patch that you led with all the people that reported to you was your B team, and that just didn't work. That just didn't work, right? Because the people are spending all their you know. 90% of the time with their functional team, not with the leadership team. And so the way we got around that was to balance that by saying, look, in both of those environments, you've got to bring your A game. And your A game is a little bit different in a leadership team as is to leading your functional team. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I really learned that. It was an interesting proposition of you can't force someone to treat the leadership team as their A team uh, and thereby demean the people they work with every day. So it's, it's a balancing act. And that's why it's difficult. That's why people get paid a lot of money to be on leadership teams to make decisions and work in teams because it's difficult. You know, just on that note, it's it just really highlights that language and even the casual term or use of um, words can have such a big impact on how people show up and how leaders do respond to the that concept of A versus B. Um, you know, on the surface you go, what's the big deal? But it really, you do see that in actions, don't you? Oh, look, and the underlying that is this, this huge area of potential for leadership teams, which is actually a line mm -hmm. on why does this team exist and who does it serve and how are we going to behave? Those are actually the first things I work on, right? And so I love your point around language and the, you know, the mental models we hold. Mm -hmm. Very different, especially if it's the first time in a leadership team. Mm -hmm. You don't realize that different things are expected of you. You've got to think about a holistic whole of business approach, not just come in and represent your patch and fight for resources with other people. And that transition to the whole of business approach might be the first time that you've had to work with people who, let's say um, I'm the marketing director, right? If I've just been promoted to marketing director role and therefore I'm in the leadership team. Mm. Previously, all the people I worked with most of the day were all marketers with similar backgrounds and university degrees. Suddenly, I'm in the leadership team, having to talk to the finance person as an equal and the HR person. It's a different mindset, different people, different rules. So you're right. This is, you know, you kind of really got me going there on that point around language translates into the whole mental model that you have around what a leadership team is for. And that's the very first thing I'm going to work on is get people aligned on that. Is that where you talk about width versus depth? What I talk about width versus depth is actually in um, once you've kind of sorted out the emotional intelligence of your team and the relationships and the dynamics and you've got alignment, that's the first step I call the emotional intelligence of the team. Then I'm going to move on and work on the creative analytical intelligence of the team, what you might call the team's IQ. Mm. In that space, that's where I'm looking for you to go deeper to, to look at the root cause of problems and then go wider to look at more potential solutions, hear more voices. And then actually go further to think about the knock-on consequences. So that, that area about deep and wide is more about the three dimensions of problems, their depth, their width, their length, and how you how you're going to navigate that as a group. But you could potentially apply that to the leadership team in that, you know, the width is my peers, the depth is my knowledge of my team, and then the um what did you say? The 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 length is like the, the thinking length. further ahead about the consequences. Yeah, the future direction. So, yeah, so I, I love that. Right. Can I borrow that? It's yours. I just think it's, you know, if you can get your, your head around that concept of um, width is how I interact with my leadership team, depth is what I bring from my own and um, and further is or length is, you know, how where are we going together collectively? It, it kind of makes sense that it would then align really nicely with when you talk about that specifically and, and with creativity. Hey, do you know what you've just done there, right? So, so I've just written this down and... You make me think about the, the T-shaped executive where we've got a depth in you know, speciality and then we've got a breadth across the business, right? But if you then add that other dimension of length, you put another kind of crossbar on, on, on top of the T going the other way, you actually get like what looks like a helicopter, yeah. right? So that's pretty awesome. That could be a nice little model. Like it's taking the helicopter view yeah. of your depth and then plus your, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Love it. Now, we don't want helicopter leadership to be anything like helicopter parenting, of course, but I, I do like the metaphor. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll, maybe we'll park this one, but I'll, I'll pick it up and have a think about it later, later tonight. Of course. Now, you, you say that leadership teams are different to other teams, and you've spoken already about, you know, there's a, a different kind of, um, uh, I guess, persona that you need to apply with each I would say that that would be the similar be similar to any team is that as an individual contributor this is how I play and then as I enter a team environment I operate within the collective um, but how do you differentiate between leadership teams and and any other team 
Yeah, look, there's a lot of language around this. So you could you know, you can work with an ex coat you could work with the board, you could work with the senior leadership team, the wider leadership team, the functional leadership team, a lot of different types of leadership teams. Um, so there's no hard and fast rule, but I tend to come in at functional leadership team. So like the leaders of the sales team, the leaders of the HR team, and I tend to come up with executive leadership teams. So that's where I play is where you're leading a function or you're leading a whole of a business. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a transition between those two levels, well, between the functional leadership team and the executive leadership team. But both of them, you know, there's, there's a nice overlap that they're required to actually come up with a strategy and lead the direction of that area. Yeah. Um, the, the executive leadership team's obviously got more ownership of the whole strategy. The functional leadership team's got a bit more of a narrow focus and has to tie into the broader strategy. But so, uh, yeah, where you're kind of starting to set the vision and direction for a significant chunk of business, that's where you're required to have different skills uh, and to step up and try and create the future, not just live in the past. Would you say that in any ordinary team, so or any other kind of team where you've got your, uh, you know, let's say your frontline staff and a leader, that in the future of leadership and what it looks like moving forward with autonomy and empowerment and our ability to kind of manage our own workload and all of that kind of thing, that that would be, uh, they would be skills that would be worth everyone um, adopting in terms of what's our strategy, where are we going and being able to connect with that bigger picture. Yeah, I've got I mean, so many thoughts that you're, you're making me think around that is uh, like overall, the future of leadership for me is going to read a little bit about understanding the system that you work in. So systems thinking is unfortunately a little bit inaccessible and dry. But you can think of it fairly simply like, you know, a, a network of people. They've got nodes that are more important than other nodes. You've got everyone influencing everyone else. And um, so I think that's the, the future versus the old models of transactional leadership and transformational leadership and behavioral leadership. Like we're getting into systems thinking and creating the environment for your people to succeed within which they have autonomy and you know, empowerment, right? So there's definitely a sense of how you need to knit all that together uh, in the work that I do is you're creating the environment. You're not doing carrots and sticks on people. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Do we do much carrot and sticks these days? <laughs> I think <laughs> some people do. <laughs> oh, gosh, I reflect on my parenting style and uh, it's, there's definitely too much carrot and stick going on. <laughs> And maybe not enough creating the right environment for them to succeed. So, uh, you know, like a little bit of a sideways jump there, but uh, yeah. we still, because humans are, you know, cause and effect machines, we love to see the world as simple cause and effect. That's just the way we wired, right, psychologically. Yeah. So there's always going to be a desire to have a carrot and stick understanding of the world. Yeah, and for a lot of people that works really well is, you know, what's the consequence? And I think you've got to have the carrot and stick. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a whole lot more than that um, in today's environment. With... Yeah, but we got. I mean, you're right. We need to help the leaders navigate that because there is that tendency to simplify, yeah. and that's the trouble. I can, you know, a year ago I was really trying to get into systems thinking how to apply to leadership, and um, I think most people just do that for a few weeks and then give up because it's too complex, right? So we have got to bring some of that stuff back. And one one great example of a simple way to apply systems thinking to leadership is the business model canvas by Alex. Osterwelder and his team is a way of representing your whole business in nine boxes. And it really simplifies how do those boxes work together from your ideal client to your value proposition to your revenue streams and your costs and your partners you need. So that's the way I apply systems thinking into business strategy is by trying to really simplify a business into its component parts and seeing how they affect each other mm. um, without getting too scientific. So so mm. bring some of the goodness of systems thinking without getting uh, without falling asleep and uh, losing the will to live. <laughs> I want to touch. I want to come back to systems thinking um, in in a few moments, but um, I want to chat with you about the the power because I see power in leadership teams that doesn't necessarily exist with um, leaders and their teams in that um, the ability for leaders or the the potential that exists for leaders to learn from each other is huge. And yet we don't seem to do enough of that. When, when I'm dealing with leaders, I'm asking, where are you going to your peers for support? Where are you going to them for development and experience opportunities? And there seems to be this 
ego, this pride, this fear of inferiority or whatever it is that prevents leaders from reaching out to their peers. And I'm really curious about what your thoughts are around that. Look, I think I want to tell you a little story about that to bring it to life, right? And I, I, I love where you're going with it because peer support is one of the core functions of a leadership team, actually. So you know, research from McKinsey shows that when an executive is in a good leadership team, they themselves operate up to 5x, you know, five times better in terms of delivering results, right? So we need to, uh, we need to think about, like, how do we support each other? And I want to tell you a story about that. So as you say, leadership teams rarely allow the time to properly connect with each other. So simple and yet so effective. So recently I was up in Hunter Valley before lockdown and we took a leadership team of a, a very large company up there. And all we did was we said, you know, on the first morning is it's time to give each other some feedback about how, you, how you're going as individuals. And I have a model for that, which, I mean, it's got a whole backstory to it, but it's, it's built on the acronym feedback is a gift. And the G stands for it's got to come from a genuine place of goodness and care for the other person. It's not your chance to get this off your chest, right? So imagine these um, 10 leaders that have been working together for a couple of years. And all we do is we send them out into the vines next to the place where we send them go for a walk in the vines, beautiful sunny day in April. Have a 10 minute chat to each other. First five minutes, person one, give feedback to person two on something that you think they, that, that would help them and then flip it. And so I can just kind of stand on the on, on the steps of this venue, watching all these pairs of leaders walking in the vines and just having the best conversations. Mm -hmm. And it takes 10 minutes. And at the end of the two day event where you've done your strategy, you've talked about the team, they talk about, you know, that was just that 10 minute walk in the vines or those series of 10 minutes walks in the vines was, was the best bit to connect as humans and support each other with that gift to feel cared for that someone actually cares to give you a bit of feedback. And that, you know, like the, the backstory to that is some, some, some particularly bad example of a leadership team giving each other feedback six years ago, which really blew up. Mm. Uh, where I, I had to work out how do you stop leadership teams uh, clashing and conflict. And this feedback is a gift story. It really illustrates the power of doing that in the right way and bringing those connections and support. And knowing that, you know, leaders model behaviour. So people don't look, people don't do what leaders say, they do what leaders do. And if you can bring a leadership team together to connect with their peers and offer feedback that, opens up conversation, it improves connection, it helps to learn and grow, then you are modeling that for your own team, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, you know, when we're all back in the office, like the power of seeing two different leadership team members or three different leadership team members going out for lunch, like that's so simple, but it shows that they're a real team because, mm. you know, part of the work I do, once we've set the leadership team up, you know, part four, if you like, is the leadership team brand. Mm. How do you show that you're truly a leadership team, that you're connected, that you're contributing and representing each different area to the wider team? And you know, the facts are that even most leadership teams have problems naming who's even in the leadership team. Like there's some research and it's, well, I said there's only four books on leadership teams, right? One of the other good ones apart from mine is uh, Senior Leadership Teams by uh, Wageman and Hackman and stuff. And they talk about asking executive teams, who's actually in your leadership team? And, and, and like most of them getting it wrong, right? And so if you look at like, if you can't even name who's in the leadership team, what kind of brand is that? What kind of role model is that? So I, I like to see leadership teams role modeling team behavior, not just individual leadership behavior. Absolutely. Yeah. And so how do you, like, what is it that stops leadership teams? You know, you talk about 10 minutes in the vines. How often do leadership teams return to the office or workplace or whatever it is and drop that? I mean, what stops them from building this into an everyday practice? Yeah, yeah. So there's a few things I've learned to do to avoid that because uh, that's the perennial problem of anyone who's a facilitator, coach, trainer is the, the kind of long lasting impact. So we all constantly kind of lose sleep if, you know, Shelly, I'm sure you're like this and I'm like this is like, how do we make sure that stuff works? Yeah. And, um, you know, first of all, I measure how leadership teams are going. Like we, we I, I generally get involved once a quarter we do what's called a pit stop, which is that time off the racetrack. Let's get off the racetrack for half a day or a day and talk about where we're at as a team, how's our strategy going, how are our projects running. 
So with that kind of cadence of quarterly get-togethers, which is like, I think it's just so important for leadership teams to take time off the racetrack. If you're the top team, you got to invest like your Formula One cars or whatever. If I don't want to stretch the analogy too far, yeah. um, metaphor. Um, so we're going to measure it. And so we're going we're to take the time off the track every three months. We're going to measure how the leadership team is going, looking at their behaviors uh, and their feelings about the leadership team. And so we can target behaviors and look for progress. And, and oftentimes there's, it comes down to how they meet. And so you can make some tangible changes to the leadership team meeting and the types of meetings they have. Because often leadership teams have, like, they have one meeting. Like we have our leadership team meeting every two weeks for an hour. Yeah. And that's not enough. Like leadership teams like need, need at least two or three different types of meetings. So that's some of the ways, like some highlights of you know, the cadence, the measurement, the traction you can get by changing up the meetings and have something own that. That's uh, some of the ways we make sure this stuff sticks. And is it important for leaders to all commit to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the alignment and commitment at the end of a conversation are important. Yeah. Uh, debate and dialogue on the way through are equally important. But the classic stuff around like when we leave the room, we're aligned. Mm. Even if we didn't agree on the way through. So for sure, commitment, alignment, absolutely. Yeah. So I just want to come back to feedback because I'm really passionate about the value of feedback and I think there's it's just an untapped resource that you know I think we can tap into what about leadership teams and I'm speaking with a few leadership teams in mind when I ask this what about leadership teams who play nice and the feedback is oh you're doing great I love the work you do you're so good at this it actually doesn't translate to hey I notice when you do this that this is often the response and what do you do with leadership teams who play nice? So this is a classic problem. So we have got, you know, if you divide leadership teams up, you've got some that are obviously toxic and everyone knows they're toxic. Mm-hmm. So that's a kind of not maybe the, the best word to use to people, but you might think about there's some real problems going on yep. and they're obvious. Yep. And then you've got teams that are on this kind of plateau of mediocrity where everyone's nodding and smiling, but the, you know, the impact is suffering where, the quality of the thinking isn't great because people aren't really putting their point of view on the table. Yeah. So that plateau of mediocrity is where a lot of teams live and there's a sense of inertia about it, but it's not where you need to be because that's where your team is just, it's just the sum of its parts. It's like, we're okay. We're mediocre. So I was doing this with a kind of thinking with a team yesterday and like there's a 20% of teams are really more than the sum of the parts. And that's where you've got that true trust, not the fake trust. That's where everyone's contributing. You're creating things that are more than you could do alone. Mm -hmm. And you're not holding these meetings, which is just kind of, they're okay. They're nice. They're sometimes boring. Sometimes Mm -hmm. they're effective. Like, uh, I don't think, because the leadership team is so important, like it's the second biggest thing that uh, investors look for after the balance sheet and, you know, P&L is the quality of the leadership team. Because it's so important. You can't afford to live on this plateau of mediocrity, right? You can't, it's kind of fuck, I don't know, something I think all teams need to be looking at, but I'm biased, right? So mm. how can we make competitive advantage through the, the, the quality of our teaminess in the leadership group, the collective leadership we have? Mm. And so with your feedback, are you encouraging that play nice or are you kind of giving them with your, with your gift model, does that encourage observations that might be blind spots to someone else that would be helpful if they knew about that and they could do something with it. Yeah, look, so this, uh, I've learned, I'll tell you this quick story about this on there, right? Because stories, again, uh, are the memorable bits, right? Is uh, six or seven years ago, doing an offsite with a leadership team, eight people, exec leaders, and we've done day one. We've talked about how the team can work better together. And we're wrapping up, we're heading towards the nice meal you always have when you're off site for two days, right? So I say at the end, it's 4.30 p.m. I'm like, okay, so before we wrap up, has anyone got anything else to add? And someone I'm going to call Georgia pipes up and says, yeah, actually there is. I say, okay, go for it. And she eyeballs Sean, the chief operating officer, and says, Sean, ever since you started around here, it's been like the Sean show. Oh. Great. And what transpired over the next kind of hour was, you know, the meeting broke up in recriminations. People were phoning each other in their room saying, are you okay? There were tears, including from the COO, you know, and Georgia. And those two people, you know, actually never spoke to each other again. Whoa. 
So that was, I, I have that real as a like, line in the sand of my leadership facilitation career, the low point. <laughs> and so that's what I like. I had to go away from that and go, like, how do I stop that happening again? We've got to create the right environment for people to give useful feedback. And that's not the way to do it. You don't surprise someone, you don't launch a grenade over the table in front of the boss. Um, you don't store it up for months and then give it, you know, like it's just was bad, right? So a lot of research developed this gift model, which is the opposite of that. It's, uh, it's genuine, it's invited, it's focused, it's timely, right? Mm. And so the way I apply it these days is you're right, we want to actually um, try and surface some blind spots in a helpful way. It's like here's like, so the, the question I ask is, what is one thing you can be really helpful for them to know? Mm. And depending on how well the team know each other and where we are in the day, I'll sometimes proceed that with Marshall Goldsmith's exercise called Feed Forward, which is also go for a walk in the vines and you tell the other person something you want to get better at and get two ideas from them of what, how you could do that better in the future. So I've got much more control and it's more about the future. So that's a really easy way in Feed Forward. It's fantastic. We love it. And then you come with, okay, next we're going to do feedback, which mm. is more owned by the giver and can include reference to things you've done in the past. So we've got to ease into it. You've got to be incredibly careful with it, but um, tried and tested systems now to get people in the right mindset to do it. And a lot of that is around, and this term's used a lot, but that psychologically safe environment, is it safe for me to share what my development areas are with you? And then is it safe for me to receive what you've got to give? Um, And that feeds into our emotional intelligence and our ability to actually read the situation, connect, adjust our language, um, deliver it in a way that resonates with the other person. Um, and you you talk about emotional intelligence. But is that are you thinking about that when when you talk about feedback? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like uh, the interesting thing about emotional intelligence is that with individuals, like if I look at an individual leader, we can imagine a scenario where someone has high IQ but low EQ or vice versa, right? They're potentially not that correlated with each other. Whereas in leadership teams, they're highly correlated. So we know through the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence and their amazing research on what makes teams smarter than the sum of their parts, it actually comes down to their relationships and their EQ. Mm -hmm. So teams can't reach their full potential in solving complex problems, the kind of problems we're all facing today. They can't do that unless they have those the bonds, the relationships, the psychological safety in place. So I sometimes talk about the fact that, you know, the, uh, the hidden intelligence in your team is actually in the gaps between people. Mm. The proof tells us that the, the ability of a team to solve complex problems is actually not that highly related to the IQ of the individuals in your team, but it is highly related to the relationships between them. Mm, absolutely. And so from an EQ, emotional intelligence point of view it's been something that has been spoken about for a couple of decades now and yeah you see it being more relevant today than it was a decade ago do you see that people are more interested in it more open to i, I hear less of the the soft and fluffy stuff uh now but i do still wonder whether there are, are more people i think there are more people on board with it now but are you seeing that it's inevitable that we've all got to go down this emotional intelligence pathway you know what that makes me think, Shay? That makes me think we need a little bit more critical analysis of emotional intelligence, right? Because we've all, I think, actually mostly accepted it. Everyone knows the phrase EQ and emotional intelligence. Uh, people know it's been around for 20 years. People accept the, uh, you know, there's a reasonable amount of evidence that EQ powers your career success more than your IQ. Mm-hmm. And if you look back at Daniel Goldman's book, et cetera. Um, but sometimes people question it and they say, well, actually, how do you measure it? Mm-hmm. And so uh, there, there's probably room for a little bit more rigor in the area on individual intelligence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I focus on that. I measure the behaviors that based on the research. So I, I sometimes do individual leadership 360 reviews in my leadership programs. Mm-hmm. We'll measure the individual, the emotional intelligence through other people's perception of their behaviors. Mm-hmm. But it's a proxy, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a way in. It's not definitive. So my job is to kind of raise people's awareness about the kind of things evidence suggests works. And then when it comes to the team interactions, there's slightly different things you've got to look for in the dynamics between teams as well. So, so I think maybe we could all be, you know, kind of pile in on emotional intelligence. I wouldn't mind if there's a bit of a debate around it rather than unquestioning acceptance of it as well. 
And I find the that um, CEOs and exec teams that acknowledge that retention of top talent is a really big issue. It's a really big challenge in the workplace today. And the connection between that and emotional intelligence, am I valued? Am I, am I heard? Um, do I... Am I com- communicated effectively and can I contribute and all of those kind of things which come a lot back to what I think is emotional intelligence is that, and I don't know whether this is the case or I would imagine there would be a correlation between those who do say, yep, top talent is an issue and emotional intelligence is how we, is part of how we go on this journey versus those who are ignorant to retention of top talent and people come and go and they explain it away for whatever reason, the industry, the environment, it was their problem, not mine. It's the younger generations or whatever it is that are still closed off to emotional intelligence. There's an underlying challenge I see there as well, which is that you've got this group of people, senior people I work with who believe they have high emotional intelligence, but actually other people would say they don't. So that's that classic effect of um, people, the less skilled people are, the less aware they are of their lack of skill. Mm. So, and it comes down to, yeah, like how truly do people know themselves? And that's that's a problem I find quite interesting is closing the gaps between people's self-perception and reality if there is such a thing as reality well, again philosophical now yeah. but it does like your, your your kind of question there made me think of the leaders i've worked with who literally i've had i remember one of them sitting in a, in a, in a cafe with them and they were saying yeah i'm I, i'm kind of um emotional intelligence my strong suit and ringing in my ears with some of the feedback i've been given about them about how they were just like i had no idea how they impacted people so um, that's another kind of variable in the conversation. There's, there's some people that recognize emotional intelligence is important. Some people that recognize it's not. There's some people that know they have it and some people that don't know they don't have it. Mm. So um, at the center of that is actually helping people really understand their true selves. I think that's a journey every leader's on, right, is to lead in that authentic way that brings the best out of themselves and not mm. faking it, et cetera. And then being able to see how that correlates to business outcomes and for those that are invested in the bottom line, being able to um, you know, create the alignment. Yeah. And I mean, one thing I observe about the leaders I work with in Australia, because I, I mainly work in Australia, a little bit in the UK, a little bit in um, Asia, mm. a little bit in New Zealand, but uh, mainly Australia is that most of the leaders I work with are pretty humble. So we don't have that high ego person who lacks EQ and is just all about them. Mm. And that might be because the type of people who got the high ego don't come to me for help with their leadership team because they're not humble enough to realize they need help. Yep. So I'm not saying this is a, a scientific experiment here, but I do like to see leaders who think about their strengths and weaknesses. They think about their role in the leadership team. They don't take up an enormous amount of space. Mm. And, and unfortunately, like uh, uh, there's with the passing of David Leckie, which happened uh, on July 20, a couple of days ago, who was a really famous kind of leader in the media space where I've done a lot of my work. Yeah. He, he was a leader kind of 20, 30 years, 10 years ago. And um, I think he took up a lot of space in the room and he led in that very much command and control shout at people way. And um, I never met him. Uh, so I'm just going from the stories I've, I've read, but I wonder whether that leadership style still works, shouting at people, demeaning them, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, I think he was in, apparently drove incredible results, was an incredible man in many ways. So uh, it's just interesting to compare that compared to what we expect these days. I do see it being a bit of a diminishing skill set across the board, but some industries are still more predisposed to that than others. But it's good to see people kind of emerging from what I would say the dark ages of command and control and coming into the, the light. And I think emotional intelligence plays a huge factor in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, potentially some people are so good, they can do command and control, mm. do it really well. But for many of us, that's not going to work. Mm. And we actually need, like we're not the perfect CEO or leader, so we actually need some help from those around us. And if we can do that, that's our way mm. to lead the company to great things. Absolutely. I always say, you know, command and control, there's a time and a place for it. And, you know, it's a little bit like a, um like a condiment it's not the meal itself it's just you know a bit of salt and pepper or sauce inside it's like i'll i'll utilize it if it's going to enhance the the dish i'll um 
you know, go there if we need to go there, if that's how we're going to get the outcome. And I think that, you know, when we first went into lockdown um, over 12 months ago, that um, a lot of organisations were just needing someone who had that, the power to go, this is what we're going to do. People needed that focus, that stability. And so there's different environments, different contexts where it works, but I don't see it working all of the time for any organisational industry. Well, at least I haven't yet. I mean, you're talking about situational leadership and picking your battles and knowing when it's a democracy and when it's, um, um, you know, autocracy, et cetera. And, yeah, I think we all agree that is absolutely crucial skill to, to know how to, how to navigate that. And there, there was a story I was, I was talking to someone recently who was uh, mentioning that their executive chairman had got incredibly involved and decided on the title of uh, this new news that they were going to do and it's like wow okay that's some um, command and control yeah you know, you're literally deciding on every single detail and that seems to be why you're stretching too far right so um you're not going to get the best out of everyone if you make all the decisions yourself but sometimes you've got to sometimes sometimes like a lot of people in our business actually want other people to make the decisions for them yeah. now they're looking at the leader to say can you, can you just tell us where we're going yeah unfortunately like on that point like unfortunately 94% of people in one study don't understand the company strategy and what it means for them. Mm. So there's a huge gap in that. We say, you know, you've got to be decisive. You've got to roll out the strategy. You've got to communicate it. But that's still a massive gap I see all the time is the, the communication piece around what the decision is and where we're going. Mm. 100%. So I don't know whether this, this is a segue because I don't know the answer to this question, but you refer to PQ or practical intelligence. What is that? Oh, yeah, right. So... My observation a few years ago was, you know, based on a, a, a friend of mine who we'll call Stephen, right, who had a very high IQ, very good academic results, but I could never figure out why, why Stephen's life just didn't seem to run very well, like in terms of, you know, that might be relationships or finances or just general common sense, mm. things weren't working. I was like, wait a minute, if you've got so, such a big IQ, why can't you go and, go and work that stuff out and read some books on how to sort your life out? And it just kind of made me realise, I don't know if, if you or your listeners have kind of had this moment, that uh, common sense and IQ are quite different. And then I see this, I started to see this in leadership teams where we could have the smartest people, but their ability to execute on a plan and turn it into a roadmap of projects and deliver it was low. And we know that 74% of transformations, for example, fail in the execution. So the strategy execution gap. Yeah. So I, I, I felt we needed a label for that, for a different type of intelligence. So I, I say leadership teams have three types of intelligence. They've got the EQ, that we talked about a lot. They've got the IQ to do the problem solving really well. But they also need that practical intelligence of PQ, the mm. type of people who love a KPI and a dashboard and a roadmap. And I love those people. Yeah. And I actually have a dashboard on my wall, you know, like, uh, so maybe I'm a bit of one of those people too. But so. Uh, yeah. We want to see, and there's been a lot of work, especially in the last kind of 24 months. Like uh, I now, I used to stop at there's the strategy. And now I work with leadership teams right the way through to what's the dashboard, what's the roadmap, what's the progress tracking, what's the comms plan. Mm -hmm. And I find that quite re rewarding. Yeah, it really does. It, it's that connector, isn't it? Of it's, it's great that you've got that emotional awareness and it's great that you've got the skill set. Now I actually put that into action, connect the two, awareness, action, all of it, it's it's great i love love the concept yeah there was a good moment in a workshop last year with a, a functional leadership team where i asked them to map out all the initiatives they wanted to take for 2021 mm. onto you know like a massive piece of, uh, of paper with some lanes on it for the different areas of their business right and the months across the top and they put 300 projects on there and then we're like how do you feel about that? And you saw the leader of this team just slumped in their chair. And so we went through an exercise of rationalizing. We say, well, you know, that's the strategy is like implying you've got to do all these things. Uh, and so we went through it month by month. What's the most important thing this month? What else can we do in the resources we've got? Mm. Okay, let's move on to the next month. An hour later, the energy had just lifted in the room. We had this fantastic, realistic strategic execution plan or whatever you want to call it, a roadmap that was like, yeah, we can do that. And we're excited by that instead of overwhelmed. So 
that's the stuff I love as well is to take people from like overwhelmed to energetic. And that's the way we think about prioritizing. Prioritizing is an abstract concept mm. where you literally put things, the time element on it and the resourcing element you can see it in front of you. Mm. And it requires you to go. So particularly for leaders, and I think about the um, more executive leader or more senior leaders really have to operate in that bigger picture. And I find that they do sometimes get paralyzed when it's like, I know what I've got to do. I've got to do this. But I actually don't know the components or the time frame or what's required and the, the practical nature of that. So I think that practical intelligence component is really important for leaders to actually move from conceptual to to action and and actually get moving in a way so i think it's yeah, a great yeah. skill to have and that's where you're going to get help from your frontline leaders and your functional leaders to refine the plan so the exec leadership team comes up with this plan it has a lane for people yeah. and then you get the hr team to go and say like you've been given that can you just actually work from that and come up with a much more detailed plan and challenge it if you want yeah yeah and then they make their plan of the hr plan with four lanes about hr so there's definitely a kind of cascading approach upwards and downwards until we've got the final plan. So I, I love seeing that happen as well because that means the HR team gets buy-in, their feedback goes up to the exec leadership team. Um, you know, cascade models of leadership are somewhat on the nose in some circles, but uh, there's still a role for that. Absolutely. Rob, I have loved our conversation. What I, I think is really important and, you know, is that leadership teams working together um, actually is so important and meeting quarterly, I like the rhythm around that, is to, you know, check in, meet quarterly, take a pit stop. I love that term as well. Um, and, you know, just really um, build that momentum, ensure inertia doesn't kick in. You've got your feedback model the book sounds amazing. It sounds like it's got so much gold in it um, and I would love for our readers to take a listen. But I want to thank you so much for the conversation today. It's been absolutely fabulous. Thank you for asking some good questions. <laughs> good conversation. So thanks so much. I, If anyone wants to connect with Rob, I'll put his LinkedIn um, bio or LinkedIn um, link in the comments and I'll also link um, in where you can get a copy of the book Unlock and um, yeah I look forward to hearing your feedback and insights and I look forward to having another dynamic leader conversation with you very shortly so thanks everyone. <laughs>